So I'd like to talk about uh, 20, 21st century home building. Uh, this is our take on it. And what I'm going to do is talk about the reasons why we think there's a need for substantial change in the industry, some of the things we're doing about it. And I am not here to sell anything. I'm not trying to change your mind about anything. But I do hope to inspire uh, some thinking on your own part because I'm really passionate about home building in general. I think we all need to team together to think about how we can radically improve this industry. And it's going to take a movement and I think we all need to be a part of that movement. Um, <clears throat> to give you a little background, uh, our company Bensonwood is a group of 65 people. Um, <clears throat> It's a part of the story because it's a real collaboration between trades and skills right there in one company with architects and engineers and woodworkers and timber framers and IT staff and software specialists, et cetera. We have four uh, production facilities at this point. Um, uh, the two largest are in Walpole. Um, and then the original uh, timber frame studio, as we called it, is in Alstead, and then we have a uh, what we call a roof shop that's in an adjacent facility. Um, <clears throat> we have, over the years, uh, built in almost every state in uh, North uh, in the United States and Canada. We've also built uh, overseas in uh, England and Japan. The only states we missed are Iowa and Oklahoma. I understand Oklahoma, <laughs> but Iowa, uh, I'm not sure what's wrong with it. And you can see uh, Colorado is dark blue. Uh, I'm from Colorado, and I'll tell you a little bit about that. Um, <clears throat> so here's a little bit more about our story. Um, and in this version, nothing bad happens. <laughs> Nothing hard happens over the years. Uh, it's all good. Um, <laughs> so um, we have always been looking toward the future. And we've always, as a company, tried to look both backwards and forwards. We've looked backwards for that inspiration and for the ideals about craftsmanship and, and uh, high performance. And we've tried to look forward to technology for how to do that in a better, more sustainable, more efficient manner. And so from our early days uh, in timber framing, uh, we developed a pretty high-tech mortising machine to make our work a little bit easier. We got involved with software development when software development was completely impractical. Uh, we developed new joinery because a lot of the traditional timber framing really wasn't adequate for the modern building codes. Um, <clears throat> the uh, early imp implementation of 3D software was almost a ridiculous thing, and I'll, I'll show you a little bit more about that in a minute. Um, today we have uh, CNC equipment that's actually key to how we do things, and we've developed the open built system. Um, we also um, have tried to uh, develop uh, some good relationships because home building is a very complex um, industry with a lot of things going on, a lot of dots that need to be connected. So uh, we developed a partnership with MIT's Open Source Building Alliance, and that's really put us in touch with industry in a very broad sense. And that's led to some joint development agreements with Uber um, and Dow and Lightalier is another one. Um, this open uh, prototype initiative has a website you can check out. It's openprototype.com. So from the beginning, um, the company was actually established in 1973. We became really focused on uh, timber framing in 1975. Um, <clears throat> that's a long story, and the short version is uh, it went up. 
<laughs> and it took about 12 days to assemble that first timber frame after we had done all of the shop work in a remote facility. And that's a part of the story as well. Um, so fast forwarding a whole lot of years, in two, by 2004, we had developed our processes and systems well enough that in the same amount of time, we raised a timber frame and enclosed an entire structure. And then by 2008, you can see our learning curve is going way up. Uh, not only did we do that, but we built an entire home in the same period of time. Um, we built several uh, lead platinum uh, net zero homes. Uh, we built the first uh, passive house in Vermont uh, just a year and a half ago. And we've launched our 3B matrix system that I'm going to tell you a little bit more about. Uh, that's about my books. Actually, the one that I'm going to sign is a little bit old. It's uh, from the year 2000. There is another one, but it's not out yet. Um, this is about some awards, and I won't spend any time on that. You don't really care. <laughs> um, this is kind of interesting or is fun for us. Uh, Eco Magazine had an article in their 2009, uh, six prefab homes that could change home building. Two of them were built by us. So um, my story and how I came to all of this, I'm from Colorado Springs. Colorado Springs is about 40 miles from Cripple Creek. So the the history of Colorado Springs and the legacy of building, you know, that I was associated with from my early days as a carpenter was minor shacks. And, and uh, you know, and that rapid push westward. And <clears throat> when I came home from my first construction jobs that were um, a part of some new developments, some new tract home developments, uh, just outside of Colorado Springs, I came home and reported that uh, that what we were doing out there is building miner shacks, <laughs> because I had seen the uh, homes up in Cripple Creek that were part of the ghost town. I looked at how they were built and I looked at what we were doing, and lo and behold, it was just about the same thing. And uh, the people I was working with in those early construction jobs were. Um, Well, how do you say it? They were people who, who weren't, who didn't come to building because they were inspired by building. They came to building because they had failed at everything else in life. And so <laughs> I learned more about swearing than I did about building. <laughs> and I learned more about not caring than <laughs> I learned about caring. And it was pretty discouraging. And, and so there was nothing about that experience that inspired me to want to become a builder. I was doing it because I needed to work my way through school and, and uh, swinging a big framing hammer was a good way to do that. But um, <clears throat> I moved from Colorado Springs to the Boston area to finish college and, uh, and I was very fortunate to get a job with a fourth generation carpenter builder whose tradition that he was associated with were those beautiful New England homes that went back 200 years. So I went from minor shacks to, you know, literal cathedrals and from people who couldn't <clears throat> say a sentence without a few F words to a person who could quote Yeats on a lunch break or the Greek tragedies, whichever I'd prefer, or teach me about the framing square and how it worked. And so I went from, you know, the really profane profession to the noble profession. And it was there in Concord, uh, in the Concord area, that I really became inspired by the potential of building and the potential of the profession. Uh, this fellow's name was Oliver Chase, and he did talk about it being the noble profession, about how we are building those places that are sacred to people in their lives, and that we define civilization in a very deep and meaningful way. 
and that it's our job to always, you know, raise that potential in every way we can through our skills and craftsmanship. Went from there to Walpole, New Hampshire, and it was more of the same, these beautiful old New England buildings, all of which were timber framed. So that's a lot of the rest of the story. But the sad story that all is the context for all of this, and some of which I saw in Colorado Springs, some of which I heard from Oliver as he reviled you know, the home building profession and what it had come to is this, that, you know, there are those of us who are craftsmen and who are trying to raise the standard in home building, but the mean that goes on out there in the home building industry is at an all-time low. And the standards are terrible for most people in this country. They cannot get a high quality building. It's not available. There is, you know, the five or 10% that some of us see in our daily lives. And there are the good craftsmen. I'm sure most of this room is full of them. But that's not the standard in the industry. This is more of the standard of the industry. And it's a sad story, but it's a true story. The inefficiency is built in. Raw materials are delivered to the building site, and you know, you'd think that's a part of a, a really important social pact, that you assume that the people on the building site know what to do with those materials. <laughs> but physical labor is applied to every part and piece. The work area is set up and taken down every day. It's a linear construction process with inadequate tools and unfortunately poor skills. Do you know that our industry is almost the worst of anything that you can talk about in terms of professional standards? And the one that I'm pointing out in the middle here, it takes more training, mentoring, and licensing to be a barber than almost anything associated with the building trade. I cut my own hair, but <laughs> if I hired somebody to cut my hair, he would have to have gone to school, been trained, been mentored, he would have to have a license. And the guy who climbs up on your roof doesn't need a thing. He needs a pickup truck, a ladder, and a dog. <laughs> <laughs> And, you know, and it's an unfortunate problem because there's a lot of technology that goes on to just working on a roof. A lot more, I think, than it takes to cut this hair. So <clears throat> there are very significant problems in the industry. Maybe one of the good things is this recession has cleaned some of that out. And the people who were not committed to it are doing something else at this point and so perhaps that's a good thing but you know where are the high school kids who are aspiring to be carpenters and builders and plumbers and electricians and where's the next generation going to come from and who would want to do it anyway who would want to do it the pay is bad the treatment on the job is bad the learning potential is bad you know what's there to look forward to and all of that, you know, results in defects. We have the worst defect rate of almost anything the consumer can buy. And it's their most important asset. According to a Consumer Reports story, they, they came up with a figure of 15%. 15% serious defects, not the cosmetic ones, the serious ones that would relate to structural problems or health-related problems like mold. And then the Orlando Sentinel actually did an in-depth study of 406 of the 14,000 homes that had been built in 2006, and they came up with a number of 80%. 
Same thing. Serious defects, not the cosmetic defects. Well, no wonder. All of the people working on the homes in the Orlando area, and this is true in Phoenix and Dallas, are untrained, unskilled, part-time, you know, hired off of the street corner, and that includes the site supervisors. So how would it be otherwise? How would anything right happen? Have you, ever, have you guys ever seen people put up Tyvek in pieces? <laughs> I've seen it. It's unbelievable. And yet, you know, most of the rest of the manufacturing industry are working toward defect rates that are less than 1%. And they talk about getting to Six Sigma, 0 0.0034. And, you know, that's the standard. And if you're in any kind of manufacturing, from cars to computers to appliances, that's what you're doing. In home building, we accept 15% as a standard. We do. You know, homeowners don't think anything is wrong with the idea that their home has problems. We just have culturally come to accept it. New industry demands. Um, you know, we have to get to the point where our homes are of higher quality and that we are going to be able somehow, in large volume, be able to get to the point where we have a low defect, high performance product at the other end. And now the consumer wants it because they can't flip it anymore. <laughs> They're going to have to live there. So our goals are to get to the point where, you know, we can bring at least an idea for how we can bring higher quality on a regular basis to the marketplace and rekindle home building as a noble profession, of course, because it is important to who we are as a civilization and a society and a culture, just like education and home care, and we should bring the same amount of seriousness to it. So in looking for solutions, which I have been my, all of my adult professional life, I started looking through timber framing. I was looking for a better way to build, something better than what I saw in Colorado Springs. And timber framing looked to me like a good method, not the past, the future. There was a craft focus that was important. And then the idea of bringing some better solutions to it came over time. In my first book on timber framing that came out in uh, 1979, I talked about stress skin panels. We call them SIPs now. Do you know in 1979 there were no companies manufacturing SIPs? Not one. That was just an idea at that time. And there were some glued up panels that we had made, a friend of mine and I, he went on to make a very successful business. I stayed with timber framing. <laughs> and, uh, and it took off, but the idea was marrying this very old idea of a structural system with a very new idea of an insulating system. And that was, we did our first house in 1977. We always believed that software would be a part of a solution because, because when you bring um, craft at a very high level, there's a lot of complication to it. And if the craftsman has to deal with all of that complication, it does get inefficient. So in 1984, we started on a process of writing software to automate the layout of timbers. And this guy here, this incredible genius, Reese Hatchison, actually wrote a front-end program that fed AutoCAD before it was a 3D program and gave us, what you see there, our version of a 3D output. And with, in a few minutes, you could get an output that would lead to being able to lay out timbers in a hurry. The other thing that really made a difference to us over all of our years 
is um, the influence of foreign craftsmen who came from other cultures in which skill and education and serious dedication are common. So uh, Masahiko Ishikawa was one of the first who came to our shop, spent a year with us. Our standards came way up in a hurry, just being associated with someone who knew because he was taught by the person who was taught by the person who was taught by the person going back 2,000 years. Makes a difference, you know? And then uh, later, uh, a French compagnon who came from the French tradition of the, you know, that did the same thing. That was in 1993. And then, and then we really got connected and we had a whole lot of compagnons, sometimes one or two at a time. Here's a few of them. And then we got some influences from Germany, from their system, trade schools, people who start at 17 and actually get their masters when they're 25 to 28. Real skill and dedication. Here's some of the guys from Germany. The other thing that always has made a difference to us is that we are a team. And timber, frame, timber framing taught us that. You don't put up a timber frame alone. It's team sport. And so we are really, really good at working together. And so everything I have to show you and to talk about today comes from a lot of good people. Not, not me. Um, as my uh, Japanese friend said, Ted, uh, you're a talking carpenter. <laughs> <laughs> So now I can say it with a little bit of pride. <laughs> I think he's absolutely right. I've, these are the working carpenters, and I've become a talking carpenter. <laughs> uh, but the working carpenters teach the talking carpenter a whole lot, and that's, that's where these ideas have come from. So this is about the open-built concept and some of the major influences. Um, always important to me to give credit and to tell you about where the ideas have come from because again, they didn't come wholesale from the sky, from me or all of the people in the company. They came from a lot of good influences. Um, <clears throat> so the, the two key ingredients to the open built ideas came from John Habrocken and his book uh, supports. John's a uh, Dutch architect, uh, spent a lot of time at MIT. Um, and he had this very simple idea that I'll get to in a minute about separating structure from infill and a lot of really good reasons why. Stuart Brand uh, wrote a book, an amazing book, uh, called How Buildings Learn. And he didn't know John and he didn't know the open building ideas, but he came to the same conclusion from his study of buildings. And that same conclusion had to do with learning or thinking about how to shear buildings into logical layers. And of course, we learned from our own timber framing. Uh, a big part of it is using the shop for cutting and shaping and using the site for assembly, getting precise fits once, and, and then being able to connect that in the field with a 32nd of an inch tolerance and the art and discipline of connections. That's key to timber framing. Timber framing is all about connections. 3D digital plans, learning how to organize, bundle, and ship, and of course working with cranes. And then from Europe, um, I've spent a lot of time in Europe, and as you saw, we have a lot of European influences through our interns. Um, <clears throat> my son-in-law is from Germany and a big part of the company. Um, so what we have learned from uh, Europe and Scandinavia is a different way to build. They don't build the way we build. Why? It's actually not very good. <laughs> and, and so they're applying more technology, more software, more building science to their building, and it is a norm. It's a standard. 90% of the homes in Sweden are built off-site but it's not the major part of the construction. In Germany, it's 60%. Austria, it's uh, about 50%. Mm -hmm. 
And, you know, they bring a new kind of software, they have better building systems, they have more attention to building science, things like acoustics. Um, if you want to see the future of building, spend a little time in Europe. Um, <clears throat> lean manufacturing is really a cornerstone of anybody, or should be the cornerstone for anybody who's doing anything that has to do with making things. There are some really good ideas about there, out there about how to be more efficient, how to get rid of waste. And so if you don't know about Kanbans and Kaizens, and if you don't know what Muda means or Mura means or Mori means, look it up. It's pretty interesting stuff. You know, we can, we are continuing to make our place more efficient and more fun by paying attention to some ideas that you know, some really big companies use, but, you know, small companies like ours can use them too. Um, so, <clears throat> I'm going to run through some of the open built systems ideas. This will be fast, um, but you look bright. I think you'll get it. <laughs> um, <clears throat> and if not, you'll ask me questions about it. So, I'm going to call this our open built recipe. It has to do with those things that I just talked about. The operating system is 3D software, CNC cutting, the open built disentanglement that I'll talk about a little bit more, constant improvement, craftsmanship that is key to everything that we're doing, and building science. The open built layers have to do with shearing the home into layers as to how they live in time. So the structure should be because you and I have seen it. It should be a 300 to 500 year proposition. I've been in homes that are 300 years in America. I've been in homes that are 500 years in Europe. They're not better than us. <laughs> we can do it too. We have to think better about how to disentangle the building so that that element can live better in time. So that should be a multi-century proposition. The skin of the building is the next layer and it's about 100 year proposition. And then we have the space plan, the services, and the stuff, as uh, Stuart Brand calls it. And each of those lives in time differently. The whole idea, you know, boiled down to the simplest nutshell is to disentangle it so you don't, you don't put the short-term stuff into the long-term stuff. So, you would not have security wires or computer wires or speaker wires entangled with structure. That'd be silly. And it would compromise the structure. So our whole concept is how to go about defining layers and making those layers accessible as to how they live in time. And by doing that, we can logically talk about how to make a high performance building a standard because we're really talking about two different things, the long-term thing and the short-term thing. And the long-term thing should never be compromised because you can't do it twice. You can't. You just can't get in there and fix it. And how many of you have seen the homes that were built in the 60s or 70s and we're talking about how to make them a high performance home. The problem is you can't. You can't. And everyone's scratching their heads about it, but the real problem is it's not worth it. They weren't built well enough to make that proposition a good idea. But how many of the old homes that are 200 years are worth it and do get the effort? Well, there's a reason why. So our open built strategy is about how to do that disentanglement and create a reorganized and disentangled system. First of all, the shell and the infill. One's public, one's private. There's, one should involve architects and engineers and one should really be dominated by the inhabitants. So in pursuit of that, we developed uh, what we call the OB plus wall that has a separate layer for mechanicals and a very high performance layer being R35 as a standard. It's now our standard wall. 
the new house rule is fat is hot. So our, our R35 OB plus wall is a fat wall. It's about 12 and a uh, half inches. Our push-up floor system is another means of disentangling mm -hmm. because you have the frame and the subfloor that are separated from the space where you put the mechanicals. And you get access to them through a ceiling system. Here's one type. Here's the ceiling panels going in place. Here's the wall system with the baseboard chase. Here you can see it active so that there's a part of the wall that is inviolate and there's another part of the wall that we know will change over time. Here's an interior partition base chase element that does the same thing disentangles the walls so that they are not a part of the structure, but also you separate the mechanicals from the smart part from the dumb part, as I say. Um, all of our homes are, are defined by a 3D grid. Um, they're very Lego oriented, if you will. And what happens is everything that we then do, we can reuse. And that makes design and construction much, much more efficient. And so when we design a house, we're using elements that we've used before, usually. And we have a proven library of a whole lot of construction elements that we don't have to start from scratch on. Whether they're kitchens or bathrooms or stairways or um, main volumes or connectors, they all fit into a library. Our 3D matrix system then distills our vast library of about 25,000 elements down into families, and that allows us to make custom homes very efficiently at a very affordable level. So our design are, you know, turns out to be more like compositions than creations, because everything in this house, for instance, came out of a library. And that allows us to reduce cost um, to a very good level while keeping uh, quality high. If we can use our standard elements, um, we're able to make very high quality buildings that say, uh, you know, below 130 to $120 a square foot um, <clears throat> and have R35 and very high performance in ceiling, um, but we haven't invented anything. Um, Another part of our strategy is build it twice, virtual before actual. Our 3D models are very, very powerful in our system because it means that um, everything in there is defined by a computer and therefore everything can be cut by the CNC machine and assembled by people. The <coughs> concept then is to do what we learned in timber framing we learned how to make very precise construction elements and take them to a site, whether it's 10 miles away or 100 miles away or 1,000 miles away, and assemble them efficiently. So what we do now is we distill the 50,000 pieces that go into a building down to 50 as a theory. And those 50 go to the site and then are assembled in a matter of days instead of months. So I think it's a new normal for the industry. Makes a lot of sense. We've already done it with windows and cabinets and doors. You don't think of those as being prefab. You think of those as windows or cabinets or doors. And, <clears throat> and so I don't think of what we're doing as prefab. It's just off-site fabrication. We're doing it with walls and floors and roof elements. And we can do it with mechanical cores as well. So here's a mechanical system going into a house, mechanical module, kitchen and bath module. Here's bath pods going into a building. Here's our wall systems in production. You can see how efficient we can be. Um, siding and drywall are happening simultaneously. Windows are in. The quality is determined. We get great building science that we can see and understand right there. We have flat, flat pack shipping because we're not shipping uh, hollow uh, modules for the most part, only for uh, concentrated mechanical areas. And our trucks are packed by the computer, so 
We don't waste any space. Site for assembly again, we avoid cutting and shaping there. We use a whole team. That's what we learned in timber framing. And those are all, you know, key elements to what I call the open built strategy. But at the end of it, we have great, great jobs. One of the really tough things for the recession for me was that we have, you know, we were hit by it too, and we just have an amazingly good team of people. And, uh, and I wasn't going to lose a one. It was really important to keep our team together. So that made it a little tougher, but, but um, we, the reason why is we have great jobs, great people, people who kind of rise to their highest self because, you know, the craftsmanship, the technology, the teamwork, you know, leads to something that's really exciting on a, on a regular basis. So our new house... Standard rules, I think, are a combination of architecture, craftsmanship, technology, innovative building systems, and that high-performance structure that, when it's all together, should be assembled on site in a very fast and affordable way. I'm going to bomb through these um, just to give you some examples of some of the work we've done. These are timber frames. This one is not. It's an aluminum frame but we applied the same ideas and the same technology. And it's, uh, here's the Unity House, lead platinum, net zero, not a timber in it, um, but a very, very wonderful building that I'm very proud to be a part of. And here you can see it going together. That's the interior of the Unity House, exterior view. This is for the president of Unity College, and uh, it also serves as a boardroom and a classroom. So this is a building that morphs from a family home to a classroom to a boardroom on a regular basis, and we, so we design movable partitions for that. Here's a building that went up in about 15 days. Um, nothing particularly remarkable except that the heating bills this past winter are under $100. Uh, it's passive house tight, which is an incredible level of tightness, and that's where most of the energy efficiency comes from. And it's a really cool thing, I think, because what we learned in timber framing is that quality is free. The difference between a 32nd of an inch and a quarter of an inch is just attention to detail, right? So quality is free. You can get there just as fast. It's free. The cool thing about performance sealing a building is it's also free. It's just about doing things right. Insulation costs money, but air tightness is free. It's just attention to detail. So we're getting passive house level tightness on all of our homes. It's a new standard. Here's a home we did for uh, on this old house. That's a virtual model, shop production, assembly on site, and then uh, some of the finished photos has a lot of good timbers in it. These were uh, ship ribs that we found as a part of the big dig in Boston. Um, so those were ribs that were intended to be a part of ships in the early 1800s. They found this inventory that never got into a ship. <laughs> so we've used a few of them in buildings. So there's a timber frame building, um, Coastal Maine Botanical Center that just went up. Um, it's a new lead platinum net zero building, about uh, 12,000 square feet. And I wanted to show you what just happened. Uh, this building started on March 15th. Um, so there's a virtual model in the shop, assembly on site, and it's scheduled to be finished in a week and a half. And it's simple, high performance, and affordable, and people who walk into it say it's a timber frame. For timber framers, it's a little odd because it has eight timbers in it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, <clears throat> but still, it sort of defines that building. So thank you very much. Uh, I, sh I sure would be happy to take questions for a, a few minutes. Yes. Mm -hmm.